Hello and welcome to This Month on the Railroad, my series where I discuss each month's big train-related news in North America. It seems that last episode was a hit with my viewers, so let's make this a regular thing. This episode is from May of 2021, and it's the second episode of this series. So anyways, let's begin. Boy, did this month go by quickly. As summer is getting closer, and we're advised that we can take our masks off if we're vaccinated, this summer is starting to sound much better than last year's. So, with the intro out of the way, let's begin. This episode begins on April 30th, the last day of April. I'm starting here because I recorded the voiceover for last episode a day before it was released, meaning I missed the last news of April. Anyway, on the 30th, CN retired their last two GMD-1 locomotives after 60 years of service. 1431 was donated to the Waterloo Central Scenic Railway in Waterloo, Ontario. 1437 was built in 1958, and it's nice to see that one will be kept running on a scenic railroad for even longer. Also on the 30th, BNSF returned Wabtec BEL 44C4D No. 3000 to Erie, Pennsylvania after successful testing out west. BNSF vows to continue experimenting with battery-powered locomotives as they see them as the future of freight rail. Also on this day, CSX released its plans for what it will do when it acquires Pan Am Railways next year. Details include upgrading tracks for higher speed service, implementing more PTC, and selling off many old locomotives. CSX plans to take over operations on March 20th, 2022, just under a year from now. Most importantly, on the 30th, Amtrak celebrated its 50th anniversary. Amtrak held an event in Pennsylvania where President Joe Biden, a lifelong Amtrak supporter, endorsed Amtrak's concept map of what its network will look like in 2035. Hopefully this means that Amtrak Joe will deliver on these promises to invest more government money into Amtrak. On the 1st of May, the Amtrak Avilia Liberty that was testing at TTCI in Pueblo, Colorado was finally returned to Alstom of Hornell, New York after successful testing. Here in Hornell, it will be finished and subsequently delivered to Amtrak. The next day, parts of Amtrak Amtrak's Beech Grove, Indiana shops used for storing paint and other materials burned down early in the morning. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but later in the month, the fires were found to likely have been an act of arson. Investigations are ongoing. On the 6th, Norfolk Southern finished a project to re-gear SD60E's number 7034 and 7035 to have a new top speed of 79 miles per hour for the office car train. A little over a year ago, NS retired their two F9s and replaced them with units that were previously for freight service only. For a while, they would just use Jeevos and often one would be a heritage unit, but now they're using two SD60E's. Also on the 6th, Union Pacific's Big Boy number 4012 was fully restored at Steamtown in Scranton, Pennsylvania. This restoration included a fresh paint job, replacing rusted parts, and other cosmetic improvements. Although it's still not an operating locomotive, it looks much better. Hopefully I'll get to see it when I go to Pennsylvania this summer. Four days later, we were hit with more Big Boy news. It was announced that the 4014 Big Boy will be running on excursions at some point this August. This will be the first time that 4014 has made an excursion since 2019, as last year's excursions were cancelled due to COVID. Exact dates and location for this year are still to be determined. The next day, NJ Transit announced that they wanted to start testing battery-powered equipment similar to the Long Island Railroad equipment I talked about last month. They're still waiting on funding, but I would be surprised if they don't get that funding eventually. On the 12th, the FRA requested that railroads help supply fuel to offset the effects of the Colonial Pipeline getting hacked and shut down. Until this issue was resolved, there was a small increase in crude oil trains between the Midwest and the Northeast. On the same day, the Indiana Harbor Belt Railroad unveiled their new Veterans Unit number 3800. Nowadays, almost every railroad is making their own Veterans Units and I love it. The next day, KCS accepted CN's offer to buy them, as their bid of $33.6 billion is $4.6 billion more than that of CP's. Now it's all up to the STB as to whether CN can make this purchase to create the first railroad in history to have trackage in Mexico, Canada, and the US. Two days later, San Francisco streetcar service resumed for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic. Unfortunately, the cable cars are still going to be out of service until the fall, but the historic streetcars are back. On the 17th, the New York subway resumed 24-hour service after over a year of nightly shutdowns due to COVID. On the same day, Norfolk and Western 611 Stoker malfunctioned, meaning that the ferry move from Spencer, North Carolina to Strasburg, Pennsylvania was delayed. Was a Stoker? I have no idea. The next day, SCAX number 903, the last unit of Metrolink's 40 locomotive order of F-125s was delivered. This means that the Metrolink fleet will have almost all F-125s very soon now that they have all 40 in LA. On the 20th, images of one of CSX's F-40s used for their office car train surface, now with F-40 number 9998, renumbered to CSX-1 and painted in a B&O paint scheme. The cars for the OCS have been in a B&O paint scheme for a while now, but this is the first locomotive to get this treatment. I bet once everything is fully painted, the OCS will do a system-wide tour to show off this great-looking new train. 
Also on that day, KCS terminated its agreement with CP to merge with them, meaning that it's fully finalized that CN and KCS are merging. Four days later, Amtrak began phase one of their reopening plan, making long distance service on the California Zephyr, Coast Starlight, Texas Eagle, and Empire Builder daily. For almost a year now, service on these routes, along with many others, has been cut to three times a week, but as the pandemic comes to a close, trains are getting back into service. Seemingly in celebration of reopening Amtrak, the third Amtrak 50th Anniversary Heritage Unit was released into service. This locomotive, number 161, is painted in a Phase 1 paint scheme, replacing 156 which was wrecked. It seems that Amtrak is releasing one 50th Anniversary Unit per month at about the same time, as the last unit, number 100, was released on the 26th of April, and 161 was released on the 24th of May. I guess that means we should keep an eye out for a Pepsi can P42 sometime around the 24th of June. Finally, on the 24th, Norfolk and Western 611 got moving towards Strasburg, Pennsylvania after a week of issues with the Stoker. During that week of not knowing what a locomotive Stoker was, I looked it up. Turns out it's the mechanism that feeds coal into the boiler, so yeah, it's a pretty important part of the locomotive. On the 26th, 611 arrived in Strasburg for a summer of excursions at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. Let's just hope that Stoker doesn't fail again. More importantly, on the 26th, Via Rail unveiled their new inner city train sets on Instagram. These new Siemens train sets will operate on the Quebec City to Windsor corridor. Also, everyone expected the locomotive classification for these to be SCB-40s, but it appears that they'll be classified as SC-44s. On the 27th, the Las Vegas monorail resumed service just in time for Memorial Day travelers. I'm pretty sure this is the first time that the monorail has been in regular service since the beginning of the pandemic. On the 29th, San Diego's coaster resumed service on the weekends for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic. Just in time for my trip to California. And finally, on the 31st, Amtrak completed their second phase of reopening, meaning the Capital Limited, City of New Orleans, Lakeshore Limited, and Southwest Chief are once again daily trains. Only one more week until the third and final phase. Well, that's the end of May. I recorded this voiceover a few days before the month ended, so if I missed some news from the last few days of May, it's because I'm in California right now, at least if you're watching this when it's new. So anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in a few weeks when I upload my footage from California.